Good morning. I hope that you guys are doing well. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. I really, really miss you from my family to yours. We really, really miss you guys. Uh, this is an interesting time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we're needing to do that we've never even thought about before. So I hope you all are using wisdom during this time and God is providing for you and you guys are using this time to draw closer to God uh, than you ever have before. Um, but one thing that that I really miss about all of this is I miss seeing people. I miss my friends. I miss family, uh, people at church, students from movement. Um, I, I miss having guests. And I'm not really one to open up my home and want to throw big parties and stuff. But I think after all this is done, I think that is something that I'll want to do. Um, there's something about having guests. I mean, think about, think about you. Think about a moment where you were had family come or a friend, someone really, really important to you. Think about all the preparation. Think about all the time you took and then the planning. For me, one of my favorite guests to have was when my mom would come and visit. And she would come and visit and we would have to make sure that every single day we knew what we were going to do. I wanted to take her to certain places. I wanted to, to have her visit certain things and, and eat certain foods. And, you know, we, we would we'd take a lot of time just to plan those things out. What I want to talk about today is one of the most incredible things that we read that happens during this Passover time. And many of us have probably read it and have gotten information from it, but there's really so many more deeper things happening than just what we read. And it's when Jesus shows up during a huge festival. Could you imagine Jesus showing up to your town? Imagine that. Imagine this. What happens when Jesus shows up in your life? What we're going to do is the triumphal entry where Jesus shows up at the Passover. So what I want you, what I want you guys to do is to grab your Bibles, follow along, and take notes. We're going to be in John chapter 12, verse 12 through 19. And what we're going to do is going to go through this verse by verse, because there's so many things happening here. I'm so excited to preach this. And, and as I was reading this, studying this, there were things that just kept popping out to me. And so uh, we're going to start in John 12, verse 12. And I want us to look at this of, of what happens when Jesus comes to town. Verse 12 tells us, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So there was this huge crowd that showed up. Why? Because they heard Jesus was coming. Now you have to understand, this is during the Passover when they're celebrating this in Jerusalem. And so there was a mob of people there already. But there were people that were specifically there that showed up because Jesus was there. So what happens when Jesus comes to town? What can we learn? Is that Jesus didn't let fear stop ministry. Think about this. Jesus at this moment was a marked man. Jesus here had already had created so much momentum, was so controversial, was so scandalous that he was a marked man. And so Jesus going into a crowded place with tons and tons of people during a festival where there are so many people there, Jesus didn't let the fear, the potential of what could happen to him, the fear of the harm that could happen to him, stop ministry. Jesus had a mission, and he didn't let fear become a roadblock. For many of us, fear so many times becomes a roadblock. Think about the things that you haven't done because of fear. Maybe it is ministering to someone at your work. Maybe it's being telling your testimony for the first time. Maybe it's starting a new ministry at church. Fear will stop ministry. And Jesus here exemplifies that fear doesn't stop ministry. I know myself, there's so many times that I have just a fear of failing. I think that's probably one of my biggest fears is just failing. Of what if I go to do something and it fails? But I have to realize that I have an incredible God that goes before me. And there's things that God has laid on your heart 
that God has gone before you, prepared a way for you to do what he has called you to do, and fear should never become a roadblock. Sometimes I've learned that you just have to do things even though you're afraid. And Jesus, knowing that his life here is coming to an end, realized he's walking into a busy, busy city. There's going to be so many people there. And the fear could have been, I, sh- I can't go there. There's way too many people there. I've already created such a stir. I don't want to go there. But he didn't let fear stop ministry. What's the second thing that happens? Look in verse 13. It says this. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, many of us, we, 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 we've heard this and, and we can visualize the people with the palm branches singing Hosanna, singing these, these cries out to Jesus. But here's something deeper that I think is happening. That even our best intentions, Jesus is bigger than we think. They looked and they were excited and they were looking, anticipating Jesus is going to come save us. But Jesus came to save us, not in a way that we think. The people were being oppressed, but Jesus had something bigger in mind. This idea of Hosanna, it means to save. Lord, save us. And Jesus here, knowing that he is going to save them, but it's going to be in such a different way, not from political root, rain, not from their situations, but he's going to save them in the way that they will have everlasting life. See, God is always working something bigger behind the scenes than we think. The people had this idea of what the Savior was going to look like, but Jesus came in a little bit different than what they thought. God is always doing something behind the scenes. For you, I want to challenge you to believe that God is doing something bigger in your life than what you think. God has such a bigger plan than even what you know. There may be aspects of God's plan that he's shown you, but I want to believe that it goes even bigger than that. Don't sell yourself short. Understand that God is way bigger than what you think. I've been serving Jesus for over 20 years now, and there's moments where I feel like I have an idea of who Jesus is in my life. And I continue to serve him, and he's kind of like this thing that just continues to unfold and unfold and unfold and expose more of him. And that's what keeps the chase going. Because when I think I have God figured out, when I think I have my life figured out, God shows me more. And he says, bud, you haven't even started. And so I want to continue to challenge you that God is bigger than what you think. That in spite of even what we see happening now, God is so much bigger than this. None of this catches God by surprise. God isn't panicking. God isn't worrying. He understands what is happening right now in your life and in my life. And he's bigger than our situation. He's bigger than what we know about him. What happens in verse 14? So the people come out and they begin to cry, Hosanna, they're waving the palm branches. And this is what verse 14 says. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just and it is written. Now think about this. I've always thought that this was an odd thing for Jesus to do. Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, rides in on a donkey. On a donkey. It just makes me, why? Why would he do that? If we understand the culture of that time, there's a little bit of insight that happens here. See, when a king was riding in to a town, usually he would ride in on a horse. And a horse meant that he was riding in with war in mind. He was riding in with victory in mind. Jesus chooses not to do that. Jesus chose to come in on a donkey, which is a sign of peace. Jesus is the king of peace, not the king of war. 
There may be things that right now that in your own mind, in your own head, you're just wrestling with. You feel like you're at war. You, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when this is going to end. You don't know how you're going to make your bills. You have all these things and you're warring within your own heart. But Jesus is the king of peace. You see, the donkey changed the tone of the entrance. And maybe for you, you need to have Jesus change the tone of what is happening in your life. Jesus brings peace. What I love is that Jesus ushers peace wherever he goes. Look at so many of the interactions Jesus has with people. People conflicted, people that were outcasted. What does Jesus do? Jesus comes on the scene and he ushers peace. If you don't have peace, hold on to Christ. Cling to Christ. Begin to live for something bigger than yourself, a Savior that died on a cross for you and for me. Jesus, he's that bottomless well of peace. He never runs out. No matter what you're going through, he makes peace available to you. Verse 15 and 16, it says this. So Jesus rides in on this young donkey. And it says, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Hold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. What Jesus was doing, he was fulfilling a prophecy that was written many, many years ago. And what was happening is people were so caught up in the moment, they didn't even connect the dots. They failed to see the significance of what was happening before their eyes. They were so caught up in the moment that they didn't put one and one together to realize this is what we've been waiting for. They were so caught up in the moment, so caught up in the praise, caught up in what was happening before them. Every single one of my kids have thought that the rapture has happened. <laughs> they come downstairs, they see mom and dad is gone, maybe I might be out, maybe mom's downstairs, and every single one of them, I'm pretty sure, have freaked out and thought that the rapture, of, that the rapture has happened. I find it funny because I'm like, <laughs> why would you be left? What's going on in your life? How, why are, what kind of life are you living that if the rapture did happen, <laughs> you would be left behind? So I might need to have a talk with them you know, next time that happens. But they get so caught up in the moment. They get so caught up in what they see. They don't take time to stop and think, well, maybe mom and dad are out. Maybe they ran an errand or maybe they're downstairs or maybe they're still sleeping in their room. Sometimes I think we need to slow down and see God at work. Sometimes we need to slow down and realize that God is doing something in our lives. I want to tell you, he's writing your story. And it's such a beautiful one. From the beginning to the end, your life is being written. And it's a beautiful one. Be part of the story God is making. I want to challenge you. For every single one of us, this is almost like a forced opportunity we have now to just slow down and just take time and consider who God is what he is doing in our life right now and what he's going to do. I understand and realize I have to take time to slow down sometimes and just realize God is so big. He's so beautiful. He's so majestic. But then I got to take time to also realize, God, what are you doing in my life? How can I use this moment? How can I use this time to where I am being forced to stay at home, being forced to be with my family? And that's a good thing but being forced to have so much time on my hand to ask myself some of the questions, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you wanting to create in me? What are you slowing me down for? But then also take moments to dream. God, where do you have me going? God, what have you created me for? What's the bigger picture? And the disciples and the crowd, all they needed to do was to slow down and just be in the moment and realize this is what we've been waiting for. And the Bible says that it totally slipped their mind, that they didn't realize until after the fact 
that Jesus was just doing what Scripture had said a long, long time ago. Verse 17, here's what it says. And the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. I find that so interesting that John here bears witness to not only this crowd, but really why this crowd was there. They were there because of a previous thing that Jesus had done. See, some people were there for the Passover, but there were some people there that were specifically there to see Jesus, and they were there to see Jesus because they had heard of something that he had previously done. The testimony drew people to Jesus. Look at this insight here. What is happening here, you see the power of testimony, of what happens when we proclaim the goodness of God. Let's not draw a crowd by our gifts or success, but what if we chose to live a mission where we drew, where we were to draw a crowd by our testimony, by the goodness of God, by who he is and what he's been doing? There's something that I never, ever mind talking to people about. And it's what God has done in my life. I love my story. To be just a kid who was broken and hurting, didn't know anything about Jesus, to as a teenager, giving my life to Christ and surrendering it and realizing God had something incredible for me. I went from hating God to being totally in love with God and wanting to go on an amazing adventure of what does God have planned for me. Make a habit of telling the goodness of God to people. There's a lot of things we could do to fill our time with to talk about. I don't mind talking about certain things, but a lot of those things aren't going to change people's lives, aren't going to connect with people like the need for a Savior like the goodness of God. I don't know about you, but it encourages me when I hear testimonies of how good God has been to people, of times where he's blessed them, of times where people have blessed other people. I love to hear good news during this time. You know, it's real easy to to get bummed out, to hear how many people are sick, how many potential deaths there could be, But I love every time when I'm scrolling through my feed or or, or I'm on the internet and I'm looking and I see a little blurb about some good news. It's called the good news for a reason. What God has done in your life, people are attracted by good news. And I don't want you to ever sell yourself short of thinking that God hasn't done something so great that it doesn't bear repeating. If you're listening And God has changed your life. You have not only a responsibility, but a mandate in Matthew 28 to go and tell people about the goodness of God. It's nothing we should be ashamed about. It's nothing that we should have to make an excuse for, but it's something that we should have a joy in telling. And we look here in this scripture and we see that people were drawn to Jesus at this moment, particularly because they had heard that Jesus rose someone from the dead. But I don't know about you, but I look at my life, and at one point my life was dead. I was dead spiritually, and God, through Jesus Christ, brought life. That is a story that bears repeating. Your story needs to be repeated. There's a power in testimony. We need to make it a practice that even in the most oddest places to the most practical places, to tell our story, to tell how amazing God is. What better time now to give good news? People want to hear good news. Tell them your story. It deserves to be repeated. And then lastly, verse 19. 
So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing? Look, the world has gone after him. You can just see and hear the disdain in their voice for Jesus. Jesus is definitely causing a stir in the town. And the Pharisees weren't having it. So what is the insight? The insight here is Jesus causes his enemies to panic. Jesus' presence will always cause his enemies to panic. And I think the insight here is not only just people who are opposed to Jesus. I know people that um, don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible. And the moment you begin to talk about Jesus, it's like they tune everything out. And so for those people, I take time to, to pray for them. I know people like that, and I pray for them. But what I want to do, let's go down a little bit deeper. Let's, let, let's peel back the layers the enemy of Christ is definitely hell and the devil. The last thing the devil wants you to do is to be effective, is to take Jesus' presence into your workplace, to take Jesus' workplace into your schools, to create an atmosphere in your home where Jesus' presence reigns. One thing that we've had to do in our home during this time is to make sure that the atmosphere, what is happening in our home, is always an invitation to the Spirit of God. That we are taking opportunities to put on worship music. That at night, every single night, we've been taking time and we pass around a notebook of different prayer items and every single one of us we pray. My kids pray, my wife prays, I pray. We try to make sure that our home is a place where God's spirit reigns. Because the one thing the enemy doesn't want is for you to be effective. The enemy doesn't mind if you wake up and you just live life. The enemy doesn't care if you just go throughout your day and get busy with your task and do what you need to do and lay your head on your pillow at night and just go to bed. Those are things that need to be done. But what if, what if we woke up every single morning and said, God, I want your spirit to go with me. God, I want your spirit to rest in my house. I want your spirit to rest at my job. Why is that so important? Because wherever the presence of Jesus is, the enemy panics. I love the idea that I have an opportunity to make hell mad. I want to do something for God. I want to do something big. I don't want to just settle. I don't want something small for my life, but I want something big. I want something God-sized in my life. I want at the end of my life to make hell so mad and to make God so happy. That's my goal. That's why I love doing what I do because I have the opportunity to not only invite that opportunity into my life, but to invite that opportunity into everyone else's. There's something that happens when we go out with the power of God to do something for Jesus. I want to encourage you during this time to ask yourself, God, how can I use this time to draw close to you, but also to go out and proclaim? There's something powerful that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. There's so many things that were happening. But the thing that I can pull from it is this, is that when Jesus shows up, big things happen. And the disciples and the people missed it, but they were still happening. And they didn't realize it till after the fact that God was doing something bigger with what they were witnessing. And for every single one of you guys listening, I want to encourage you with this, that God is doing something way bigger than what you think of that your life isn't small, your life isn't insignificant, your life is huge. And God had you be born at this time, wherever you are at, in the family you are, in the year 2020, so you could do something amazing for him. 
Use this time to begin to ask God, God, what are you creating in me? And how is that going to be used? Guys, I miss you guys so much. My family misses you guys. Every single one of you guys. From the people who sit in the back to the front, to the cheap seats, to the VIP section, movement. Guys, we love you guys. And we believe God has something amazing for you during these next two weeks where we celebrate who Christ is and what he has done for us. So I want to encourage you guys with that. I just want to pray pray a special prayer for you guys and just believe that God would do something big. If we can, let's pray right now. God, we come before you and I just pray for every single person here, God, that you would use these next few weeks that we have together. And God, instead of trying to answer questions of when is this going to be over, when will things get back to normal, God, let us ask the question, God, how can I draw close to you? How can I invite you into my worry, into my fear, into my inadequacies? God, your word says you are sufficient for us. I ask, God, that we would understand what that means during these next few weeks. And God, you are really what we need. We thank you so much, God. And I just pray a special blessing over all of our families, all of our students, grandmas, grandpas, children. God, that you would just bless us during this time. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with opportunities to bless other people. God, bless us with the joy of our testimony. That you are alive. You're a God who's working. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for listening. Next week is going to be awesome, I'm sure. I just want to tell you guys, love you guys, miss you guys. Be safe, be wise, stay close to Jesus. Amen.